Hi, my name is Denise Lockwood, and I want to welcome you to the very first Racine County Eye Race in Racine podcast. And I want to explain a little bit about how this podcast came to be. Over the last few weeks, I've been thinking a lot about the protests, the racial disparities that exist in our town, and how people have responded to these stories. And I have to be honest, sometimes when I look at the comments section on my Racine County Eye Facebook wall, I'm horrified at the number of people who don't believe that racism exists here. Yet, we were named the second worst place for black people to live in the country. But then I got to thinking, do we really have a good understanding of how people experience racism, systemic or otherwise? So I asked several people in the community about this and I wanna share their stories with you. My hope is that by listening to these experiences of people that may not look like you, you'll have a better understanding of our community. This is also a podcast about chronicling the movement that is emerging around how to address these issues. The, they are so complex and tightly woven together that those of us not experiencing these problems have been become blind to them. This has created two receipts that desperately need to act as one and start hearing one another. Today we will talk to Maurice Horton, a member of the Racine Common Council. His experience with race has come from a variety of situations, personally as a black man and professionally. He spent time in prison for dealing drugs, but then he was part of a gang prevention task force. And he also served as a school liaison officer at Mitchell Middle School. And right now he's focused on helping to train people through WRTP Big Step. He's also experienced racism firsthand during a traffic stop that happened in Stevens Point. So with that, I'll begin. Here is our first podcast about race in Racine. I had a young lady call me. I said, Maurice, I was just going to call you just to see. I hadn't seen you out or nothing like that. And uh, I hadn't seen you at any marches and all that. So I explained to her, you might not have to see me. My vote counts. My vote counts. That is, it's going to start at the local level. It's going to start with the Common Council. It's going to start with the mayor. And it's going to start with us making changes, not only just uh, policing, but we have a whole lot of issues that are at hand. And I think people are jumping the gun and they're going to miss a, a major part of it because we're not organizing. And when I say we're not organized, I'm not just talking about black people. I'm talking about people, people that have concerns about the same issues. So we are just in a silo. This person is meeting with the mayor or talk to the mayor or the county exec or this person and that person, it's all single, it's all single handedly done. But I think that we really need to strategize and talk about what are the areas that we are hurting. Uh, not only is it just economic growth for the uh, African American community, but we're talking about education, we're talking about housing, we're talking about poverty, we're talking about all these things. It's, it's a huge monster, it's a huge monster to, ta to task and take on. local council 
people are calling me, asking me, you know, what are my thoughts? What am I, you know, what what do I think about this process? So please believe I'm working and I'm I'm working mm-hmm. and I'm trying to find a a um, a decent way to lay out some. So I am working on some with the with a guy from Gateway, a data analyst, and we're looking to. I'm looking to roll out some type of uh, um, uh, some type of restorative justice plan, some type of plan Good. that the community that the community can buy into, and that instead of incarcerating people, we have other avenues and let the community hold people accountable for some of the actions that are taking place because it's their community that they live in. So uh, they're going to do a study. Uh, Payne and Fraser are going to do their study. Uh, they're supposed to come back in 90 days, but that'll give me some time to really flesh out some of the stuff. We're trying to talk to some professors about restorative justice. How does that look in a community? Uh, and uh, I'll give you a, bit, a little bits and pieces of how does it look. And we have 15, excuse me, we have 15 districts. And how can we break all those 15 districts up for these people, for people to uh, kind of like police them own selves with other people involved, you know? Uh, with maybe somebody from the DA's department, somebody that's been in prison on the committee, uh, elected official on the committee. And so we just look at all these avenues, but now we're in the process of trying to collect data. Like, what does this look like? And, yeah. And it's, it's so, like I said, so many, it's so many pieces to this thing that, you know, I just think that in the moment, just, and this is a moment, this is a moment that, you are seeing some changes. You are seeing some people going forward, but I just feel like in the moment you get, you, you leave out stuff that's important. Yeah. And so, and so far you have to really, you really have to, you know, I won't say take your time, um, because people, people want things to happen overnight. They want them to happen right away, but yet it's still, you don't want to leave out anything. You know, you, I, I tell people, if you have a gripe with what's happening in the city, why don't I see you guys at Common Council? I don't, I'm working, uh, this thing about poverty. There's a, there's a group down in Dallas, Texas called the Urban Specialists. And we were going to bring them here and they, they, and what they do, they specialize their movement, their movement with pro, police brutality, police misconduct, uh, but they also a movement for the people of Dallas, you know, feeding them, uh, shelter, uh, for the homeless. And so we tried to bring, I tried to bring them here. They came here three times. And the backstory on that is that we met with S.C. Johnson. The chief was involved. Uh, uh, Pastor Harbo was there. And this was all during the Dante Shannon's uh, killing. And after the results came back that there, that supposedly or whatever, Dante had a gun. Because I know Dante, mom, Bib, and Keita. You know, I'm friends with friends with both of them. Yeah. Uh, it's it dropped. Yeah. And so this is now. Here's here's another backstory that, and I didn't know. I didn't know a lot of this information. So we had the guys from Dallas up here. We were looking to start a chapter called the Urban Specialists. They kind of like emulate what they're doing down in Dallas, Texas. So we. Uh, the bishop, Bishop Omar Jawa, he's the, he's the leader and the CEO of the Urban Specialist. And he's also with Deion Sanders, the NFL football primetime, primetime guy. So Deion goes to Omar's church. And so they have the movement called the Urban Specialist. So they was coming to Milwaukee to handle some business, uh, in Milwaukee because they run the VFZ. The VFZ program is kind of linked in with them also, in which I was running here at the school district. Long story short, they come down to Racine. I asked them what they come. They came. The bishop came. And then the third time he came here, he flew here from Dallas. He told me to get some people together, all the gang members. He said, get every gang member you know. Get everybody that's out here from the streets and get them together. And we want to meet with them. So I said, okay. So I got the Tyrell Davis, Booby Mayfield, all the guys I know that's, you know, in the street and uh, trying to change their lives. And we all met at the church. So Kanye used to work for me at Gang Diversion. She was my assistant, my secretary. She worked with me. And so Nikita goes to pass.
Pastor Evans' church. So for the first time since all of this stuff happened, we brought those two together. And 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 uh, Denise, I didn't know what was going to happen. I'm not going to lie. Really? Uh, I was nervous. I was unsure. And Tanya said, Reese, I want to face him for the first time since my son. Now, I went to Harry funeral. It was it was sad. I went to Harry funeral. I went to Dante Shannon funeral. I went to Tyrese West funeral. Why? Because I knew all three of them. Mm. And I knew their parents. And it was a heartbreaking thing for me to do. But I went and they said, and the bishop mediated what happened. And it was, Tanya was crying as if Harry had just got killed yesterday. Like, just, and then the hurt and the pain that I seen her go through. Matter of fact, the night he was shot on Memorial Drive, the chief called me to ask me, could I get to the hospital? Because he knew that I knew Harry dad, Harry Kennedy Sr. I used to run with them back in the days on Chicago Drive. And he knew that I knew them and they knew me. So I went up to the hospital. Uh, Mount Pleasant police was guarding the ER room. Tanya was just, she was crying. She was just distraught. I was trying to talk to me and her pastor, Pastor uh, Frank James. We was trying to get her to get in the car. Uh, it was it was at least 60 people out there. So I grabbed my brother Damian Dolly from the break. We went up there because they know us from back in the day. So it was this moment. I never, I never forget these. I never forget these moments, these times of what, you know, really took place. But they brought them together and they, for the first time, embraced each other, hugged each other. Tanya said, I would have paid the money back. It has something to do with, uh, I guess they thought that Harry had robbed somebody for some money. Yeah. And yeah. they was coming back and it was a lot of Facebook chatter. It was a lot of shooting back and forth with the, with the two families, a random shooting on the south side, random shooting on the north side. Uh, other family members had started then toting guns for their own safety. And so they finally had met and it was a real, it was a, it was a moment I'd never seen in my life. And I've been doing this 20 some years. I cried, uh, to see the hurt and the pain they both was going through. Nikita said to Tanya, Tanya, I went to school with you and I wish you would have just reached out to me. And he said, I was even trying to get Dante out of town to move to Platteville because they was out to kill him too, because they found out that he was going to turn, you know, evidence on them, this, that, another. So it was a moment that, that I said, man, when I said I never experienced, I never experienced. And so the bishop was going to use that platform for other people and other parents that were going through the same hurt and pain, even though it wasn't, even though one was police and the other was black on black crime, he wanted to set the stage that we have to keep fighting for our community we have to change our mind process and our thought process. And that's why I'm at a lot of stuff that, we, that we're doing. On the other hand, systemic racism is real. Racism is real. Uh, a lot of the things that we're going through are real, but I want our people to know that there are some avenues that we need to take also, you know, that sometimes we blow off. We blow off education. I done worked in the schools. I done seen it firsthand. I've been in the schools all my life here in Racine. I just got out of Mitchell when Mitchell was going through its worst times of being at Mitchell. I was there. I was in the hallways. I hear what happened. I see what happened. And a lot of stuff, uh, even when teachers were unfair, I intervened in and I just told the student, hey, let's, let, let me handle it. Let me, just like I would tell my own kids, let me go in here and talk. And sometimes it would work. Sometimes it wouldn't work. But I would go back and tell the principal, like, hey, y'all need to work with her because she ain't trying to deal. And she ain't trying to hear what's, you know, what's going on with the kids. But most majority of it was because most of our teachers wasn't from this area. They had grew up in areas where there were no urban kids, no urban students. And then these type of behaviors were behaviors, again, and which I agree, uh, Denise, that wasn't going to be tolerated. 
and we have to teach our kids too in America and at your job, you can't cuss your boss out and think you're coming back to work the next day. You yeah. At the, at the basic level though, you know, just having read criminal complaints for 20 plus years and, and done a lot of stories, I, I really think one of the missing pieces is we gotta really look at the mental health of, do a mental health assessment of uh-huh. a lot of these neighborhoods, like at a very grassroots uh-huh. level, because I can tell you, um, Who's that one fellow that worked at the Brave that um, was the focus on Father's Guy? Um, uh, uh, Van Carson. Um, or Zaki. 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 Yeah, Zaki he was. Zaki. You know, Zaki. he told me something that was really interesting. He said, Denise, pot smoking is the Prozac of the poor. Uh-huh. And when you're going through all of that trauma, uh-huh. you, you got to do uh-huh. something to figure it out, right? So. You are 100% right. And these are the grassroots, and you just said the key word, grassroots. Yeah. We can't just, we can't bite off the big chunk of the pie and say, hey, let's go full blown. Let's start off with something small and start working through this stuff. Trauma is real. Right. It is real. And when I go to the little corner store to buy something, before I'm out of there, 30 blunt wraps have been bought. From banana to cherry to whatever, and the stove is just compiled. It smells straight. I, I was sitting there smoking, smoking loud with them because they're trying to escape. Right. Escape the pain and the pressure of society. And sometimes their own, their own failures. You know? Go ahead. What do you think should happen next? Oh, uh, since, since we don't award it the money to. <laughs> Since we don't awarded the money to uh, Payne and uh, Frazier, I think we could we should get the recommendations from the task force. I think we should really see what they come back with. Now, I made a statement on Council 4. These are my words. I said, this is the time, this is the moment. I say, but, but, I would ask that the council adhere to the recommendation of this study. See, most of the times, it's not the studies not come, that's not coming up with the right stuff. They are. It going forward after the study. It how do we channel what they asking or what their findings are? Because we trust them to do a study, right? We trust in them to talk to people. We trust in them to get out here and to interview people and to find out and get the data and collect the data and come back and say these are the changes. It's going to take more than police reform. You know, and some things, a lot of these cases is, a lot of these cases is common, I'm trying to like common sense. Let's just go back to, and I'm not going to hold you to this because I could talk to you forever. I know. Uh, <laughs> let's just, let's just go back to the George Floyd. Let's just go back to that. And from the video that I've seen, he was sitting, when they got him out the car, whatever, the officers had him sitting on the side by the store. He was right there, handcuffed by the store. He was all by the store. If a person is saying to you, sir, I am having difficulties breathing, don't be a smart ass, just think it's another ploy or you done heard it all before. Call the paramedics. You sit them back down and say, man, just have a seat. 5504 paramedics, we had cherry and blah, blah, blah. You still going to arrest them, right? If the paramedics come and they check them out and they, they, they take them to the hospital, the police officers are going to the hospital with you. They're going to put somebody on duty at the hospital, sitting by your bed. They're going to handcuff you to the bed. And when you get better or your respiratory or your anxiety goes down, they're going to escort you from the hospital to the jail. You're going one way or the other. But to get to the point of going further of how that took place, some of the stuff is just ridiculous. And since then, I've seen five more killings of black men the same exact way. I've seen the same exact way. There are people telling them, I can't breathe. They still, still proceeding on. Can't breathe. Because they have to understand that at some point, a lot of people anxiety kick in. You know, when the police get behind them and they, and three of my coworkers got stopped in Stevens Point at gunpoint. So me, Neil Moore, Murphy Hooks, 
and Tammy Mavis. You know, Tammy is a probation and parole officer. She worked. Tammy used to be our assistant at Game Diversion. We went to a gang conference up in Stevens Point in 1998. So me, Tammy, and we was joking around, messing with Tammy. And he was like, man, Tammy, you the only white girl in this car, man. We going up north. Man, we might end up getting stopped up there thinking they might be kidnapping you, right? We was really playing to these, really playing. So Tammy was like, you guys are so crazy. So Tammy was sitting in the back seat reading her book. Me, I was driving. Murphy Hooks was in the front. Neil was in the back. So we went to Walmart. So we went to Walmart, and we was like, man, we got to get a little snacks. We want to get some snacks and stuff, and we won't have to be buying stuff out this vending machine because it was kind of pricey. Went to Walmart, we was walking around, and, you know, people was watching us, but I wasn't, you know, paying attention. I'm like, shit, this is a college up here. We should be good. You know, I know some black people up here, so I'm just walking around. So me and Tammy together, we laughing in the aisles and stuff. So when we left, they said, let's stop and get some beer. Let's stop at one of the liquor stores and get some beer. I was like, okay, where we go then? It's like, hey, just keep straight down, we And we was probably one on the left. I think it was called Cops or Copes or some beer stores. So... I'm driving, I see the police officer on the other side, female. She look over at me, and I kind of glanced at her a little bit. And then I see her making a U-turn, like making a turn, coming on the other side. Where I was at? And I was like, oh, man. So I'm looking. So I say to them, I say, hey, y'all, uh, it is a uh, police behind us like that. And it's like, man, you kidding me. I said, I'm for real. So I was like, we just going to keep going, and we are going to turn around. We're going to turn around when we get up here to make turnaround, roundabout. So when we got further down, I mean, the police were everywhere. They were out their car. They had us at gun. They had me at gunpoint. They was, you know, behind their doors with their rifles out. And so I turned. And when I turned, there was a shitload of police there waiting, all with their guns out. I was like, what the hell is going on? So I pull over. They said, driver, get out the car. And the, and the people in the car like, Reese, what the hell is going on? I said, oh, I don't know. I said, but whatever it is, we need to find out. So I had just got finished meeting with Mac Reynolds. Mac Reynolds was share. So Mac Reynolds had gave me the car and I was a part of a, I was a part of the Midwest gang investigator. I was one of the members and this is all, this is all law enforcement. So they give you a car, say, Maurice Horton the star of Midwest Gang Investigators, Wisconsin. So the guy told me to get out the car, driver bagged back to me, I bagged back to him. He pulled me by my belt loop and he said, hey, what you doing up here? That was the first thing he asked. I said, beautiful. He said, what you doing up here? What, what you up here for? I said, uh, I'm up here for a gang conference at the Best Western <laughs> on Highway 10. And I said, uh, what's wrong? And he said, he said, let me see your license. So when I opened my thing, that rental card was the first thing I seen. Sheriff. I seen, he seen that card. He seen that Midwest gang investigated thing and I gave my license. And I said, hey, I'm a part of the Midwest gang investigators and I'm at a gang conference at the Best Western. I do not know what's going on. And then when he seen that, he started getting real nice, like, Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. So, all right. Um, hey, you have a nice day. You, you know, put your seatbelt on. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I asked him, I said, who, who are y'all looking for? Oh, we're looking for Maurice Harper that escaped, supposedly escaped from the correctional institution. And that, uh, you fit his description and he had frequently be with a white girl named Tammy. I knew that was a lot. I was like, this is a lot. I know it's a lot. But at this point, all I want to do is get back in this car, get off this dirt road, and get back to this hotel because I'm not going nowhere else after I get there. So we get back in the car. Tammy crying. She upset. She like, what, Reese? What happened? You all right? I said, I'm all right. I'm good. So we went back to the hotel, and some of the guys from Portage County Sheriff's Department was at the training. So they in there drinking scotch. They down by the pool. And we come in there and it's like, hey, what's going on? I said, nothing, man. I said, man, some of y'all guys must have just, just stopped us, man. And I said, man, they come out, they was looking for somebody. And one of the guys looked at me and said, hey, Reese, read through the lines. Just read through the lines. That's what he said to me. And I didn't know what he's talking about, just read through the lines. And I said, 
we got back.